I want to give a massive welcome to everyone joining us today online, our Firestarters churches around the world. Uh, here in Hereford is Mother's Day, and maybe it is with you where, where you're connecting in. And I want to say a massive uh, thank you to the incredible, incredible mothers, the phenomenal women around the world that we get to do life with. I am so grateful for this village, for this community of women that we get to raise children around. It is really, truly something. Beautiful. Uh, today we are continuing our Jesus series. We are looking at things that maybe we don't always talk about with Jesus. Sides of his character, aspects of his personality, who he is, what he's done. Um, and, and today I get to track some more of that. Last week, Pastor G brought an incredible message on Jesus, the troublemaker. Today, I'm going to be, I think it's up on the screen, talking about Jesus the brother. Jesus the brother. And we're going to dig into this. I'm going to expand on it. I'm going to give the particular focus that I have on this message. But today, I'm going to be talking about Jesus the brother. And so much of it is centered around a, a Bible verse in Romans 8 that we're going to get up on the screen. And it says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You know, we hear a lot about the church as a family, as brothers and sisters, spiritual mothers and fathers. But here we hear of this idea of Jesus as the older brother, that he's the older brother amongst many brothers and sisters. And, uh, and I think there's something very powerful and unique about this. And so I'm going to expand on it. But uh, just to give you a little bit of the, the process that I have as I'm preaching, normally, kind of the couple of weeks before I'm preaching and I'm praying into it, uh, I, I'll just get kind of thoughts or ideas, maybe stories that will just like come into my mind at random points. And I'll tend to just jot them down in my phone and slowly the, a message kind of forms and it's like, okay, I, I get a sense of where God's leading me. I can, can feel where the, the, this is tracking. Well, to be honest with you, on Monday, I sat in a meeting with Pastor G and I was like, I got nothing. It's not coming together. I got random thoughts. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to preach on Sunday. And a number of our other locations are going to be preaching a similar message to this. So I needed to get my notes to them and I've got no notes and I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, Pastor G is the best person to have in these moments because he's like, come on, Shani, you got something in there. Let's come on, let's draw it out. And I'm like, all right, sure. I got this. I got this. It doesn't work. Um, and so we were just having a little conversation about, you know, this radical nature of Jesus. Pastor G was saying, you know, the, the radical nature of the troublemaker. But it was incredible. Pastor G started saying, you know, one of the, the most radical things about Jesus was the way he was with women. And I was like, go on. Uh, it's like, you know, how he pushed against the, the cultural norms and the social norms and the historical context of the time, how he empowered women and gave women a voice. And I was like, I can preach on that. I can preach on that. Um, and, and, and it was amazing just through that conversation, the preach just came. It was so quick, this quick download of, okay, God, I see where you're taking me. I see what you want me to deliver. Um, and it, it really just flowed out. Um, and so today, it felt very fitting, Mother's Day today. We're coming off the back this week of International Women's Day. Um, and, and so it felt very fitting. And so I'm actually going to be bringing today uh, four stories of women in the Bible and how Jesus interacted with them, uh, kind of the journey um, that he took them on. And uh, I want to say, if you're here today, sorry, parched my Maybe particularly if you're a man and you're like, Sean, that's great. Love that. But I'm not too sure if you're just going to be talking about women. Why, like, why wouldn't you bring that at she? Now, I'll tell you two particular reasons. <laughs> Number one, <clears throat> as women, we predominantly hear uh, from church stories of men. And most of the stories we read in the Bible are stories of uh, men and their interactions. And never have I felt limited 
by that. Never have I felt held back by hearing the stories of men because I believe that I can learn something through that. We as women have learned to glean wisdom, encouragement, strength, encouragement, I don't know, there's more words, from the stories of these men. And I believe that you can do the same from the stories of women. <clears throat> Secondly, I, you know, we started off today with that, that scripture from Romans 8, inviting us to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus this older brother, to, to model him, to be like him. If I took the message that I was going to share today and I only brought it in a context of women in an environment like she, I believe that you would be missing out on the ability to be conformed fully to the likeness of Jesus because there are aspects of his character that you may not be fully aware of. There will be parts of who he is that you won't fully have explored. So this is my gift for you today. This is my gift for you, an invitation to be conformed to the likeness of this incredible older brother. Now, I think I probably could have picked a more epic title. You know, you're talking about Jesus with women like, you know, Jesus the liberator, like something like, oh yeah, that's fiery, that's punchy, that's cool. But I actually believe there's something so powerful by discovering Jesus as the brother. What he, this older brother with his sisters. And it's actually something maybe we can connect to a little bit more. You know, maybe not everyone in the room is going to spend their whole week thinking, how can I be the liberator? But in a church context, we are brothers and sisters all the time. We talk so much in the church about fathers, mothers, a brotherhood, a sisterhood. But how often do we talk about brothers and sisters? And this very, very key relationship that we are supposed to have with one another. And I believe that there's a lot that we can unlock and, and explore through this. And so before I dig into these four stories, I just want to set a little bit of a historical, cultural context of the time that, that we're looking at as, as Jesus was born and the environment that he was raised in. And I've got some... some uh, context to give you. First of all, there was a very clear and distinct gender hierarchy, both from the religious rule of the time and the Roman rule of the time. There was very clear household codes that people were to adhere to. It was very clear that women were less than men. There were very clear roles in what was expected, and that was the societal norm. The daily prayers of Jewish men included this prayer of thanksgiving, praise be to God that he has not created me a woman. Men were not to greet women in public. Some prominent Jewish writers and um, rabbis of the time taught that women should never leave the home except to go to synagogue. Women were not allowed to study the sacred texts. There was a, a prominent rabbi, Rabbi Eleazar, first century teacher, who was noted for saying, rather should the word of Torah be burned than entrusted to a woman. They were not allowed to be witnesses in court. And, you know, we've got that context at the time, but then we know that Jesus' teaching spread through the early church, a lot of that within a Greek context. And lots of Greek philosophers at, at the time, such as Aristotle, taught that women were monstrous, deformed, and weak men. That something had gone wrong in biology, and that women were deformed, monstrous, weak men. This was the context that Jesus entered into. This was the context with which we read the Bible verses and how Jesus, the older brother, interacted with his sisters. And so we pick up this first story um, in Luke 24. Jesus is actually, we're going to kind of go backwards a little bit in the storytelling journey, but Jesus actually at this point has been crucified and he's in the tomb. And we pick up the story of these women in Luke 24, and it says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Just quickly on this point, I love that these women, they weren't just there for the miracles. 
They weren't just there for the teaching. They were there very early in the morning. And this was the earliest they could get there because it had been Sabbath and they are bringing spices to, for his dead body. They want to prevent the smell of the rotting body. These women show up, and I know so many of you women show up again and again and again, not just in the happy high mountaintop moments, but in the low and the challenge, and I want to honor you for that. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Now, I've heard it said that women were invited into this moment because you actually knew you were going to get the details of the story. <laughs> that these ladies, they will let it be heard. They'll make it known. I was thinking, I don't know if this is going to work. You know, I feel like Joff would need to be up here to do one of his little storytelling. You know, he does his little da da He's the two people. And you can imagine like a conversation between a husband and a wife. If it was like the man that had been at this moment and it's like, oh yeah, he wasn't in the tomb. Hey, what? Jesus! You know, it's the whole like, uh, yeah. Uh, how do you know? Uh, two men told me. What two men? Oh, I don't know, but they were like wearing white. Well, like an angel. Oh, yeah, I guess so. It's like, you can just imagine this like conversation unfolding and God and Jesus are like preparing beforehand and they're like, let's just give it to the ladies. Like the news will get out. At least people will get the details. Um, but this is so profound. I cannot tell you how significant this moment is. The first ever people to know about, to witness, to speak about the resurrected Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, were women. These women would not be allowed to be witnesses in court, but they were witnesses to the most profound moment in history. Absolutely game-changing. It's phenomenal, but it's interesting. We track the story to verse 11. And verse 11 says, let's see if I got it. I don't think I've actually got it on my, oh. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like, what? Their words seemed to them like nonsense. Now, I'm not here to... Come hating on men today. But I believe that both men and women at times can bring something of value and the other gender discredits it, tears it down. You, you're not really thinking about it. You're overanalyzing things. You're overly emotional. Whatever it is, on both sides, I believe at times we can discredit because God has uniquely designed our minds to think differently. Now, I'm not here to stereotype. I know that there's so many ways that women's minds can work and there's so many ways that men's minds can work. But I do believe God has designed and orchestrated us to think differently and that that is a gift. And that that is something for us to lean into, to discover more of. Why do you think that way? Sometimes it's terrifying, but it's, it's fascinating and it should strengthen us. And so I've got, you know, as we go through this message, I've just got some like um, takeaways for you. Some of them are going to be things to think about. Some of them are things to action. Um, some of them are things to remember. But the first one, um, we've got is Jesus values and trusts the voice of women. You know, this story, this is kind of a foundation I want, I want to set in this message. Jesus values and trusts the voice of women. It's incredible, isn't it? In she this year, what are we talking about? She speaks. She's got a voice. It's a valued voice. It's a trusted voice. And then the second thing, learn to hear 
not just to listen. You know, as men and women, brothers and sisters, this is what I want to draw out. As brothers and sisters, you're going to bring different things to the table. Learn to really hear what someone is communicating before you wipe it out, before you discredit what they're saying. Learn to really, is there something deeper going on here? What are they really trying to communicate? Go beyond just listening and truly trying to hear. The second story we're going to head into is with Jesus and a couple of his friends that just happen to be women. And so we're going to pick up this story with Mary and Martha, Luke 10. It says, now while they were on their way, Jesus entered a village called Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who seated herself at the Lord's feet and was continually listening to his teaching. But Martha was very busy and distracted with all of her serving responsibilities. And she approached him and said, Lord, is it of no concern to you that my sister has left me to do the serving alone? Tell her to help me and to do her part. But the Lord replied to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, that which is to her advantage, which will not be taken away from her. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's amazing to me how the lens that we read scripture through can so impact what we hear. Because I have heard so many women particularly read this message and they're like, man, so now I'm overwhelmed by all the stuff I need to do, but now I feel bad because I'm also not sitting at Jesus' feet. It's like, oh my gosh, and it just adds weight. And we are completely missing the context. If you're reading it through a lens of guilt, you're missing the lens of freedom that he wants you to discover and explore. Again, we need to set this in the cultural context, the historical context of the time. This was transformative. Jesus was speaking to a woman, teaching a woman outside of the synagogue, and coming against the identity that many women, women would understand that their, their time and their body was there solely to serve men. And he was coming and saying, hey, as your older brother, I don't want you to come just to serve me. I want you to come and sit with me. I don't, I don't value you just for what you can do for me. I value you for who you are. This was groundbreaking. This is absolutely revolutionary. Like, for if, if, if some of the Pharisees heard this, this, would, this is heresy. You are, you're changing up the household code. You can't do that. But he's making a very clear statement. No, I value you, not just what you can do for me. You know, we're not going to read it now, but he, he continued to shake up the household code when he knelt down and washed the dirty disciples' feet. Because that, in the household code, was saved for the lowest of servants. But he came in and said, no, actually, this is a position of value. I'm going to show you a different way. This was so transformative. And so the takeaway, Jesus values you for who you are, not what you can do for him. He values you for who you are. My priority isn't what you can do for me, but being with me. Now, this third story we're going to go into would go against everything that Jesus, as a Jewish man, would have been educated into. And so we're going to pick up this story now. Luke 8, and it says, And a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years and had spent all her money on physicians and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his outer robe and immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus said, Who touched me? While they were all denying it, Peter and those who were with him said, Master, the people are crowding around and pushing against you. But Jesus said, someone did touch me because I was aware that power to heal had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came up trembling and fell down before him. 
She declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, daughter, your faith, your personal trust and confidence in me has made you well. Go in peace, untroubled, undisturbed, well-being. You know, in, in Jewish custom of the time, if a woman was bleeding, she was seen as ritually unclean. And not only that, if she were to touch someone, they too would also be seen as unclean. The issue for this woman, though, this wasn't just a, a few days a month kind of thing. This was an all day, every day situation, which meant she would have been shunned by her community. She would have been shamed. People would have seen her as cursed. There would have been a distance put between her. But we see in this moment, Jesus is not uncomfortable. He is not uncomfortable by her shame, the things that she feels overwhelmed by. You know, the reality is Jesus healed many people at a distance. He didn't need her to come close to heal her. He could have healed her body when she was the other side of the world, but he knew to heal her soul, she needed to come close. And so there was this invitation to closeness, to heal her body, but also to heal her soul. She needed to know that in proximity, you don't need to feel shame. Like, I don't see you as cursed. I see you as chosen. There's this deep, intimate moment with this woman that brought healing. Now, we don't talk about this kind of bleeding a lot from stage, maybe more in she than, than here. But I know actually for women, some women in this room, this kind of bleeding is the reason why you hate Mother's Day. This Bleeding is the reason why it reminds you of the thing you long for, but you have not yet experienced. And, and my words, I know, aren't going to take away the pain of that. But I also want you to know this is not God's punishment. I've heard women say, is he just testing me? He's not testing you. He wants to draw you close. He wants to come in comfort and set you free from the shame and the labels that you've put upon yourself. You know, often in our English um, Bibles, uh, scriptures are given headings. They're not actually the Bible. It's not scripture. It's just to help break it up. And the heading that this is often given, it's the woman with the issue of bleeding. And personally, I would love to rewrite this and call it the the daughter of faith because that's what Jesus called her. Jesus called her the daughter of faith of faith. And I believe that some of us in this room, men and women alike, we have taken on headings of our suffering, titles of pain that have marked us. And today I believe that Jesus wants to come and he wants to rewrite that heading over you. Daughter of faith, son of faith, this is who you are. I know your pain. I know your struggle and I want you to come close to me, but know who you are. You are a daughter of faith. You are a son of faith. And so the takeaway is he wants to heal body and soul. But maybe you're here today and you're like, actually, my soul feels pretty good, which I love. If that's you, that's great. That's awesome. Then I believe he wants to invite you into a greater level of compassion. You know, if we're called to be conformed to his likeness, what does Jesus model here? Great compassion. He wasn't worried what people would think. It's like, oh, he's unclean now. Didn't bother him. He didn't didn't worry about the people that came up against him, who he spent time with, who had dinner with, because he was full of compassion. We don't often know what goes on behind the scenes of people's lives. We catch glimpses, we, we see the highlight reels, but there's so much that goes, beyond, goes on behind closed doors even that we don't know. And I believe God is inviting us all, men and women alike, to, to more compassion, a greater level of that. Um, I think there's also something, uh, we will get to the fourth story in a bit, but there's a, another part of God that I think is super interesting. And um, Pastor G was the one that mentioned it the other day. So if, you, if you've got an issue with it, you can take it up with him. Um, and, and that's the maternal heart of God. Not heresy, the maternal heart of God. And I've got a scripture, I, I could dig into it more, but we'll do a quick, quick roundup of this. 
Isaiah 66, verse 13, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you and you will be comforted. Like we haven't just fabricated motherhood in ourselves. It's, it's not something we've made. We are made in his image. And so mothers, maybe you've not heard it before, but actually your motherhood is created in his image. There's something of your femininity that actually is found in a design that God has orchestrated. It's very interesting to me that Paul, who is this strong, passionate, fiery apostle, he actually uses seven maternal references to how he feels about the church, which statistically is more than the paternal references that he uses. Paul is often misquoted in terms of uh, women in the church, but he uses more maternal rather than paternal references in how he feels towards the church. It's something of God's design. It's how he's created us, and it should be celebrated. You know, Jesus came into this cultural context, but our context today to realign, to realign what he had always designed for women but God in his very nature wrapped it into the fabric of who he was so that we could be created in his image. It's so powerful. And, and today I also, I wanted to speak to some of the men in the room today. If you just knew what some of the sisters in this room have experienced and are experiencing, I think you would be horrified absolutely horrified you know as a woman but as a as a pastor of women like and i and i want to say this with sensitivity even for some of the women in the room i don't want this to be triggering but oh my gosh the abuse the assault the humiliation the degrading the intimidation the control the manipulation it honestly feels unending sometimes and and i share this with you as brothers because I believe that you play a key part in bringing change within this. But I, I have to say, honestly, the number of times I've been in conversations and I you know, have been both heartbroken and filled with this righteous anger, and I come out, and even as I was preparing this earlier, like uh, yesterday, I got quite emotional. Um, as I was just thinking about it, because I have come out so many times and thank God for so many of you men. And I consider myself so privileged because so many women don't have what many of us have, which is I can think of so many safe men in this room. And I want to thank you to those of you. Yeah, I want to thank you men. For those of you maybe that have actually kicked against what you knew to be those that would apologize to be those that will raise your kids well, to be those that empower women and give voice to women and encourage women. It creates such a safe place physically and emotionally, and I cannot undervalue that. I don't think many of you men realize what you offer, and I wanna say thank you to you. I know uh, chatting a while ago to someone in this room, a good friend of ours who is saying he is so intentional about the time he spends with his daughter because he was raised in an environment where sons were very much more valued than daughters. It, a father wouldn't spend time with his daughter. He'd spend time with his sons, wouldn't spend time with his daughters, and he's trying to push against that. But he, he can only change because he's acknowledging. And, and I believe as we are conformed to the likeness of Jesus, we have to acknowledge and we also have to assess, what are my thoughts? What is my speech? Maybe similarly, maybe you were raised in an environment where women were seen as less. Be that a, a cultural thing or just within your home, that women were seen less than, that there was limitation upon them. And I think there's something of asking. Maybe actually it wasn't so much the environment you were raised in, but maybe your work culture. You know, and... To start with, it was kind of awkward to laugh at some of those jokes that belittled women, but now actually you're the one that instigates them because it gets a good laugh. Or maybe it's the stuff that you watch online that degrades women, or maybe if you're really honest with yourself, you know that the way that you treat your wife doesn't align with what we're hearing about and God's heart. And I'm not here today to come and point the finger or bring shame, 
But I think there has to be an, an acknowledgement for change. And so I want to invite you today to truly assess your heart, assess your words, assess your motives. And then something that is really key, if you see something that is off, get accountability. Go tell someone, because the enemy will want to hold you in shame even potentially, the things you've said, the things you've done, the things you've looked at. But if you go and you tell someone, you are way more likely to see long-term change and difference in your life. And then to the, to the, to the women, but actually to everyone, I guess, um, I want to say as well, if you are experiencing abuse, that you are experiencing physical, emotional, sexual abuse, something that you have experienced maybe historically but not told anyone. Today, I wanna really encourage you not to hold that any longer. Now, I know that that, that may be incredibly complicated. I'm sure that there is fear attached to that, but I want to invite you today, speak to someone you trust. Come see me. Speak to your small group leader. If you don't know anyone in this church and you've walked in, speak to one of the VIP volunteers. Just share, hey, I've, I've got something I need to talk about. We want to make that a safe space for you and a safe environment for you because we know that sadly it happens way more than we would want to think. But there can be freedom. You know, we're hearing these stories. Jesus walked individuals into greater freedom and I believe there can be greater freedom for you too. Okay, and so we're going to now finish with our last story, uh, the last individual, and I love this. I love this. We're going to go to Luke 7. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. This is such a significant moment. Incredibly significant moment in history. Now, I don't know if any of you watched um, the coronation of King Charles and there was this point that he was anointed with oil and you had the choirs and you had the robes and you had the archbishop. And even it, what they did for the coronation is they actually sealed it off so people can see it because our, our common eyes aren't holy enough to witness this moment of the king being anointed with oil. How different was this moment when the king of kings was anointed. We, there were no robes, there was no priest, there were no organs and choirs. There was a sinful woman that Jesus invited in to be the game changer, to be the one that came in and anointed him as king. Not just any woman, but a sinful woman. Like the, the love that this woman must have had for Jesus. And I think, again, it just shows how safe she must have felt with him. That she could walk into that room and experience judgment, to experience mockery, but to know that with him I am safe. I love him so much I don't care what is going on around me. And she pours the oil. She, she weeps. She wipes his feet with her hair. And, and, and the, the point I want to make from this is that your history does not define your destiny. Because of Jesus, your history does not define your destiny. Whether you're a man or woman in here today, the things that you have done wrong, the, the, the areas where you screwed it up, doesn't define your destiny because of his grace. And so what we've learned today, ladies, he values and trusts your voice. For, for all of us, he wants to have time with you more than you serving him. He wants to invite you close to heal body 
and soul. Because of His grace, your history does not define your destiny. You know, my prayer through this series is that we would fall more in love with Jesus. As we find out more about Him, we'd be more in love with Him. And as we are conformed to His likeness, as we want to become more like Him, a courage and a faith would rise up in us to create a change. And I believe on the back of today, there's almost like three responses that every individual in this room can make one of. Number one, I believe that some of you, He is calling you to action. You need to go and share with someone what's going on. Well, you need to change the way that you've been speaking. There's, there's a, a call to action. For others, I actually believe this is, the, the sole purpose of this message for you is to encourage you. It's to encourage you as to how Jesus sees you, how He loves you, how He wants to invite you close. But thirdly, I believe that there are people in this room that He wants to invite into a relationship with Him. This older brother who wants to go on a journey with you, that wants you to understand His grace. Maybe you've been learning about Him, but actually you've discounted yourself because your history wouldn't line up with one of these Christians. Or maybe you, you just didn't understand it all. And honestly, we won't understand it all. That's part of the journey and the joy of following Him. If you understood it all now, it'd be a boring journey ahead. That's the joy of journey. You, you find out more, you discover more. It's incredible. It's so fun. And today there's some of you that He wants to invite into that or He wants to call home. Maybe once upon a time you followed Him, but you've just journeyed off. Today, He's inviting you home. He's calling you back into this family. It's a wild one. It's a messy one, but it's a beautiful one. Yes. Brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, and He's inviting you home today. And so whilst uh, I'm going to invite everyone across the room to close your eyes, just out of respect for one another. And I'm going to pray a prayer and, and you'd be so welcome to pray it with me. You don't need to say it out loud. You can pray it in your mind. Um, a prayer to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as the older brother that's going to journey with you. So Jesus... I thank you that you didn't put a bunch of barriers in front of us to reach you, but you used your body as a bridge so that we could cross over to you. Right now, Jesus, I recognize that I have sinned. I've got it wrong. And I ask for your grace and your forgiveness. Jesus, I want to, to follow you to learn more about you, to walk in your ways. Thank you for your forgiveness. Today I choose you. In Jesus' name, amen.